So there's just one more section here to complete this um, this series of lectures and and wrap up this story. Um, there's there's uh, a couple of more successes for the ten hour movement uh, that occur uh, right about this time. Uh, and again, it's contributing to this liberal bourgeois order of stability where it's like things are getting, you know, better for the worker. They're still being exploited in the ways that Marx describes, but it's not as harsh as what it existed even in the earlier decades of the 19th century. So we have Graham's Factory Act of 1844. And remember that the Communist Manifesto was published at the beginning of 1848. So we're getting close to the, the date of publication for the, for the Communist Manifesto. So Graham's Factory Act uh, started out as Graham's Factory Education Bill. So it was very much focused on providing uh, quality compulsory schools for working class children uh, through government subsidies. And the opposition, this is from a newspaper, all government interference to compel education is wrong. If government has a right to compel education, it has a right to compel religion. Okay, so who is writing this? You know, um, think about the mindset. Uh, but also compare it to the kind of pol political rhetoric that we see today in 2021, especially around the um, critical race theory uh, uh, arguments. Um, so that was the bill it met with this opposition in 1843, but in 1844 it passes, okay, with, with uh, significant modifications. Uh, but what it does institute is that children nine to 13 are not gonna work any more than nine hours per day. Okay, with a lunch break, okay. So now it's getting better for that youngest cohort. Remember before any children under, under nine they're not allowed to work in, in factories. And, um, and now we have nine to 13, the youngest cohort can only work nine hours. Uh, you know, that's better than the 10 hour work day. And, and remember that the 10 hour work day movement, their original strategy was 10 hour work day for children. So that's been accomplished, but it's continuing to roll forward to making the workday more manageable for adults. So uh, part of this legislation is that the ages need to be verified by surgeons because you can't just trust the parents because they may say, oh yeah, my kid's 13 and you know they're really like 10 years old, uh, which was fine under the, uh, the previous legislation. And women and young people, and young people here is ages 14 to 18. So the second age cohort of fact, uh, wage earners um, and notice that women are included now. So that women are to work under the same restrictions as young people. So, so it started out as talking about children and now it has evolved to talking about young people and then we're folding in women of all ages. So this 10 hour, um, uh, movement uh, has really, you know, has really set in. Uh, it's a, it's a, a very a big success. Uh, and, and remember that, and, and maybe even in some of our minds, they're like, oh, but we might be saying, oh, but what if I want to work overtime? It, well, there's no overtime, right? The, this is just, this is working, this is your regular shift. Uh, every day, do you want to work 12 hours every day, six days a week? Um, 
uh, let, let's think about it. Um, and that really turns into a 14 hour day. Uh, there's a limit to what people can physically do. And so just like they played the card politically with children, now they're able to wrap women in there. And you know, ultimately what they're trying to get to is a 10 hour workday for everyone, uh, for adult men as well. Because that's really what the unionist wanted because the long work days were just killing people and, and making it so that they couldn't work in their later years because they'd be so debilitated from the hard work they were doing earlier in their career. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so women are now wrapped into this second age cohort and uh, uh, they're not gonna work any more than 12 hours per day during the week and they have to have one and a half hours for meals and nine hours on Sundays. So now we're starting to get Sunday set aside as, a, as something of a weekend sort of day, um, which is all just kind of a traditional thing that goes back to feudalism. You know, the serf had that day of rest on Sunday, which wasn't really a day of rest but they would work a little slower and they would go to church and you know, and there was more social activity on Sunday and they might do some work, but it wasn't a full day's work. Uh, this is kind of getting back to that notion of having Sunday as a day of rest uh, to, some, to some degree, okay. Um, and they want all, everyone to take their meals at the same time. It's not like somebody has a lunch break here, somebody has a lunch break there. It's like, we really have a break where things slow down and, and, and then we go back to work. It's not just this factory running 24 seven and people are like in this, this relay race kind of thing. Um, okay, so timekeeping uh, by a public clock. So then there'll be inspectors that inspect the clock because that was one thing that employers like to do is they like they like to make the, the clock run slow. And then they would get more hours out of you uh, because the official clock was running oh, ever so slightly slow. Um, and there were lots of gimmicks like that, that that capitalists employed to squeeze more variable labor out of the, the laborer and get that surplus value so they could, if they could just get a few more minutes, that's a few more dollars in their pocket. Um, or a few more pounds in their pocket, okay. Uh, now this might sound incredible, but this is a, a reflection of what was going on all the way up until 1844. Some classes of machinery to be securely fenced such as like a steam engine or a water wheel, flywheels, uh, and every part of a steam engine, okay. Um, so the, the shafts that are coming out of the steam engine into the workroom need to be fenced off so you can't just walk up to them. Uh, or a water wheel, the main shaft coming into the building needs to be fenced off and protected so it's not just fully exposed and people can accidentally run into it. Uh, and every part of the steam engine, the steam engine has to be fenced off so that people can't just willy nilly walk up to it or fall into it. These are things that weren't in place before this point. Children and women are not to clean moving machinery. So even up until 1844, children and women were cleaning the machinery while it was in motion. So now from here on forward, the men, adult men have to do that. Okay. And then accidental deaths are to be reported and investigated. Uh, factories are to be washed with lime every 14 months, you know, like every year, but they give them 14 months for a wiggle room. And they need to keep records pertaining to all the provisions of this act that can be inspected on demand. And we see this, you know, today, if you've ever worked at, uh, you know, some kind of wage slave, you know, uh, hourly job, uh, 
Um, and if you're working like in a restaurant or something like that, there's all these checklists, you know, all that documentation is actually kept for inspection by the health department. Uh, th that goes back to uh, this law right here. Uh, and an abstract of the act to be hung in the factory so as to be easily read. Also, if you've ever worked at an hourly job, uh, there's a break room. And then in the break room, there's all this documentation, all these posters that tell you all your rights and everything. That convention comes out of this act as well. So this is where all that stuff comes from. And it was the hard work of this 10 hours movement, which was, you know, infused with Owenite utopian socialism, anarchism, uh, different variations of socialism, religious reforms, you know, all, all kinds of things like that, but a socialistic atmosphere, an atmosphere of socialism uh, that was countering conservatism. Uh, and even the Whigs versus the Tories, the Whigs were beginning to be seen as conservative, uh, you know, basically what, what began to happen is the Whigs and the Tories were occupying the same uh, political space so that they weren't distinct from one another. And, and once you have people occupying the same political space, then an opposition party will emerge at some other, other place along the political spectrum. We're seeing something like that today in the United States where Republicans and Democrats are occupying the same political space. Um, rhetorically, you know, they have all sorts of strange things that they argue about, but when it comes to passing laws, they're largely in agreement. Um, and they may make shows of fighting one another, but the laws that are going to get passed are the laws they're going to pass, and they pretty much agree on all that. Um, the Whigs and the Tories kind of devolve into that, but there's this socialist movement that then opens up the sp political space for the Liberal Party to emerge. And the Liberal Party, again, is not, uh, is not a, a super uh, left-wing, you know, sort of party. The, the Liberal Party is just a counterweight to conservatism. And, um, and, and trying, you know, the Liberal Party then is trying to make capitalism actually work. Conservatives are willing to just ride the, the capitalist machinery into the wall, you know, and just, you know, it's very short sighted. Uh, liberals are more far sighted trying to think, well, how do we keep this running without you know, running it into the ditch. Let's let's not abuse people to the point that they totally get up in arms. They actually take up arms. We'll just manage it and and exploit them as much as they can bear, but let up when it when things head up, heat up, and then you know just keep on correcting to keep the whole capitalist exploitation model going. Um, okay, so, uh, and then finally, in 1847, this is three years later, so we have 1844, um, a big, big gain, and then uh, three years later, <clears throat> a huge success for the 10-hour movement, um, which began all the way back in the 1830s, really around 1830, and the Peel administration now, uh, so Prime Minister Peel, as the you know, chief executive of the British Empire is still in, in power, uh, but um, he runs into a problem with the corn laws. This is restrictions on wheat, um, which they're having these political back and forth about these corn laws that were instituted during the Napoleonic Wars. And then, and then uh, grain manufacturers wanted to keep these these protectionist measures in place and there's a famine going on in Ireland and it really blows up in the face of Prime Minister Peel uh, and so he resigns and, and you know and they have to form a new government in 1846 and um, the new cabinet that comes in is a very mixed opinion on the 10-hour question now this is a 10-hour question 
uh, that is being applied to women and young people rather than uh, the 12 hours that was gained three years earlier. Now they're pushing for 10 hours uh, for women and young people. And, um, and, and this factory's 10 hour act uh, of 1847 does restrict women of any age and young people 13 to 18 uh, to working only 10 hours a day. So uh, that is largely what the agenda was, I mean, maybe even more so than what was explicitly stated in the 10 hour movement back in the 1830s. Um, uh, but of course, behind that is the intention of keeping moving forward and getting a 10 hour workday for adult men. Okay, so, so that's, uh, that's the end of our story. And again, this is a kind of denouement. It's uh, not real exciting at the end. It's just kind of playing out and, and things are getting more stable and we kind of see, okay, now, now things can go on like this. And this is really where capitalism starts to uh, take the form of capitalism as it existed in the 20th century and, um, and is what we generally think of today in 2021 when we talk about capitalism. Um, okay, and it's a, a bourgeois liberal capitalism. Well, and then I, I've tried to explain what all that kind of nuance of lingo means. And uh, to kind of just drive home the point, I would like you to take a look at these videos. This kind of, these videos give you kind of a visual and will remind you of everything that I've talked about here in these, these lectures. And, um, and ju just think about, uh, think about what I've said and, and let these, these videos, these salient videos at the end be uh, a kind of refresher for all the ideas that I've touched upon uh, because they do allude to everything uh, pretty well and pretty briefly. These are very short videos, uh, but they kind of just are alluding to things. And, and so I want you to kind of see if you can pick up on the things that they're not quite saying entirely explicitly, um, but are, are definitely in there. Okay, so uh, that is the end of this uh, series of videos. I will have more sections of videos for you to watch, and then we'll get into um, analyzing. Uh, first, I want to do a, a, a textual analysis of, of Marx and Engels, the Communist Manifesto, and then I'll do a textual analysis of Dussel. And then I want you to write your paper about Dussel. All right, so that, that's coming up, and I'll get this stuff uh, posted ASAP.